Who can kill a child? Um, I don't know. A good question, and the intriguing title of this 1976 Spanish horror film. The theme of evil kids was rampant in this period, with many of the genre's biggest hits directly tying into it. The Omen, The Exorcist, The Child, The Little Girl Who Lives Down the Lane, and many other films that begin with the word the. Some have linked the prevalence of these fears to the introduction of contraception. In a world where sex's main function was becoming a bit of a carefully rough and tumble, children could be viewed as the strange abnormality that could come with it. Who Can Kill a Child, also known as Island of the Damned in America to capitalise on the village of the damned, is a lesser known entry in this trend, but very much deserves attention for its grimy, sweaty madness. A movie's opening is like the first line of a novel. Initial impressions can be vital in hooking your audience. I'm happy to announce then that the opening credits for Who Can Kill a Child had me drawn like a brain dead trout to a wriggling worm. If you want to creep someone out, what better combination than the isolated sounds of children singing and children laughing? These same sounds loop over photographs of real-life tragedy, acting as transitional divides between vignettes of documentary footage and narration. The voiceover provides information on various horrors of recent history that have had a shockingly negative impact on the lives of innocent children. The concentration camps of World War II. The poverty sustained from ongoing conflict between Pakistan and India, as well as the use of napalm in Vietnam, which was of course at this time a very contemporary issue. This onslaught of giggling children juxtaposed against the brutal truths of our world lasts for seven and a half minutes. It lets you know this film isn't going to fuck about. It also sets up the concept that no matter the conflict, it is always the children who suffer. Well, maybe, just maybe, one day the children will decide enough is enough. The main plot begins in stark contrast to the grim credits, as an English man and his pregnant wife holiday in Spain. They soak in the local culture, but the festival in town is a bit too rowdy for them, so they seek out a small island off the coast that the man once visited many years ago. They rent a boat and arrive on the island in good spirits. But, just like an Oasis song, little by little, it becomes evident that something is seriously wrong. The uncanny feeling builds tremendously, rising from the general disquiet of the island's seemingly abandoned state, how it seems normal life just suddenly ended in a hurry, to the more directly worrying phone calls and reveals of hidden corpses. After the lengthy setup, the couple realise in full white knuckle terror that it is the kids who have routinely murdered all of the adults on the island. They need to escape, but they are severely outnumbered and encumbered by the wife's pregnancy. And of course, they are afraid to lash out in self-defense. Because, after all, who can kill a child? Forget all about Reagan's demonic transformation. These children are scary because they are just so normal. There is no attempt to portray them as anything other than regular kids, who instead of playing with wooden swords and toy guns, have graduated to the real thing. It's all a fun little game to them, gleefully smiling and giggling as they go from whacking a piñata to pummeling a poor old man to death. The only abstract notion comes in the most simple form possible. The kids in this murderous gang approach other children on the island. The others are acting normally, until they make eye contact with the creepers. Suddenly, via some unspoken telepathic bond, they are recruited into the rampage. It is the very definition of understated, and it works wonderfully. Who can kill a child is basically what you get if you take Hitchcock's The Birds, but replace the birds with children. 
It is not the most comfortable watch. Even putting aside the violence, the whole picture oozes a sweaty vibe. Some might bemoan the long build-up, or find the wife to be a bit annoying with her persistent questioning, but the second half of the film delivers on both giving the actress some amazing material to work with, which she knocks out of the park, and offering a satisfying release after that long build-up. If you've already seen the film, you might be ranting that satisfying is not at all the right word. Probably not. The last ten minutes in particular are fucking wild. I have seen imagery in this film I have never seen anywhere else. And the end scene would have been perfect if they had just taken a little bit more inspiration from Hitchcock and kept it silent. Kept it all implied without dialogue. But hey ho, that minor quibble aside, it is a real ride. Check out the film and maybe you'll find an answer to the titular question. <laughs>